Hello and welcome to Mel Make Stuff. My name is Melissa and in this video today, I'm going to show you every single one of my current works in progress. There are a lot of them uh, to the point where it's starting to overwhelm me a little bit. And so I am interested in taking the month of June. So it's the beginning of June right now. I'm gonna be filming this throughout the month and hopefully show you what I'm able to accomplish by the end of the month. I have a lot of plans for the second half of the year. And so at this point, I'm just feeling like I need to get some of this stuff done. And so that's going to involve some finishing. It's going Going to involve some ripping out and it's probably also going to involve like putting some stuff in in hibernation and just being okay with that so let's take a look at all of my projects so here is everything i am currently working on <laughs> most of this you haven't seen before i know you've seen the blue shimmer and my hypnosis sweater, which is the one out of the Japanese knitting book. But all the rest of this, I think I've just sort of been doing on the side and haven't really been talking about on the regular episodes. A lot of these I cast on when I had COVID back in March and was feeling sorry for myself. So I'm not sure uh, how good of an idea that was, but some of these should be pretty easy to knock out. So let me just go one by one and we'll take a look at everything. So this one is actually completely done other than some weaving in of ends and it needs to be blocked. So this will be an easy win right here. This is the Nido Pullover, I think is the name of it by Jared Flood. It's a relatively new release and it's an entirely brioche sweater, which uh, is sort of giving it a lot of bulk, but I decided to use the Elspeth Lavold Silky Wool, which I really enjoyed working with. I haven't knit with this in probably a couple decades, uh, but I really, really liked it. So I definitely will be knitting with this yarn again. You can see we've got some typical Brooklyn Tweed pattern finishes like the sewn hems some nice shaping in the brioche and uh yeah so it's just a nice boxy charcoal gray sweater the other neat feature of this pattern which is hopefully easy to see is that there are these welts around the neckline and and also right above the ribbing for the hem so that's sort of the other nice touch of this pattern. So this will probably be first up for finishing. I'll weave in whatever ends are left and block. This one is the Claude Cardigan by Johanna Garish, I think is the designer. And the interesting thing about this pattern is that the body is knit in a bulky weight. I think the original called for some kind of We Are Knitters superwash merino that was just gonna pill in like one second. So I used some Alifas Lopi. And all of the hems, so it's finished with turned hems um, that are folded in and sewn down to the inside, including the button band, which was the first time I'd ever done that technique. And the bands are all knit with one strand of fingering weight and two strands of mohair held together. So the bands are all knit at a significantly different gauge than the body, and I thought that that was very interesting. Just to show you a little bit of a close-up, obviously I used a variety of beiges. I wanted a neutral oversized cardigan. And you can see that there is a turning row that creates a nice ridge along the edge of the button band and the cuffs and hem are the same way. And then the inside is finished very cleanly. For the buttonholes, you make the buttonhole as normal on both the right and the wrong sides of this turned hem. So I thought that was really interesting. They're not connected in any way, although we'll see if I decide to, to sort of sew through these with some sewing thread to just sort of bind the edges a little bit. I'm not sure if that's necessary or not. And the thing that I am the most excited about here are these amazing buttons. Have you guys ever seen buttons like this? I had never seen this type of button before. I was looking for some door set buttons on Etsy and then these popped up. They are, uh, there's a specific name for the style of button that I will put in the description below. And I, so I bought these specially made to be this size to go with this cardigan from a particular seller on Etsy. But since then I have actually bought a little kit to learn how to make these because they are so cool can hopefully see these buttons have a little loop on the back of them already so I will probably also create like a little thread shank just so that there's not a ton of stress being put on the button but that's the plan for those 
And then this one is going to be also an easy finish because I'm actually going to rip it out. Uh, this is the Linia shawl, which I had talked about a little bit in my plans for 2023. So when I started it, I was just using a single strand of the Isier Alpaca 2 in this natural white. And I'm not super happy with the fabric. It's fine, but it's just not all that special. <laughs> So I had texted my sister because she has a bunch of this natural colored alpaca lace weight in her stash. So you can see it's just a little bit hairy. It's not uh, not like a mohair or anything, but I think it will just thicken up the isier a little bit so that this shawl has a little bit more weight. So I'm going to rip this out and I won't restart it immediately, but I'm going to keep both of these together so that I remember <laughs> this was the intent when I restart it in the future. So next up we have this almost finished wrap. This is the Wild Grass Wrap, which is a free pattern by Pearl Soho. And I am using the Alpaca, it's an Alpaca Merino blend that I got from Purgatory Farm Alpaca back at the Vermont Sheep and Wool Festival that I attended with Selma and Mega. So you might remember me showing this. Mega had gotten the same color and I think the same amount. And we were both thinking about making a poncho originally and I sort of was going back and forth on the poncho idea. And when I saw this pattern in Pearl Soho, I was like, yes, that's what I want. So I really have this the vast majority of the way done. I think I only have a couple of repeats left. This is the wrap size. There's also a scarf size, which is skinnier, I think, but maybe the same length. And so this, I shouldn't have any problem finishing this month as well. Okay, so a blue shimmer update. So I have finished the body. You can see it is quite cropped. This is right about the shortest that I would want a sweater. It will hit at the top of like a, a high, relatively high-waisted pant waist. I have done one sleeve, but I'm not overly happy with the shaping of this, so I'm going to redo the bottom part of this sleeve and the cuff. But right now I'm working on the second sleeve over here and I'm gonna keep the shaping the same as this original sleeve, but then you can see that there are some pretty rapid decreases right here. And then this cuff is just way too too tiny for my wrist. I, it's uncomfortable, like I can get it on, but I don't like how tight it is. So I'm just going to maybe rip it back to about here and rearrange the decreases so that I can just have like a normal sort of close fitting straight sleeve. This one hopefully can also get done before the end of June. So now we're getting into the projects that I'm not too sure if they can get done this month, but so some of you might recognize this as the Northern Augustans number one. This was another one that I had talked about in my 2023 plans and let's see where we are. So the original pattern has like a pretty long turtleneck and you actually start with that. I didn't think I wanted that long of a neck, but I also didn't want to make the decision. So I actually provisionally cast on. So I'm going to need to go back and figure out what I actually want to do with the neck. Right now I'm thinking a folded neckband that gets sewn to the inside just in this main color. So for the main color, I am using this natural colored Nutiden. I'm holding two strands of that together. And for the contrast color, I am using some, this is just some like random superwash DK that I dyed myself back in the day. And this is a lichen and lace mohair in the faded rose colorway. But I think this one was sort of irregular. Like most of the time when I've seen this colorway, it's been more pink and this is a little bit more uh, light. It's just lighter, lighter than the typical colorway. So. so you can see how that is coming together. The yoke is done, obviously. The body, I'm not exactly sure why I stopped at this point. I think I was maybe thinking I would stop and do the neck and the sleeves and then finish out the body. It's hard to say. I haven't worked on this in a little while. Oh, you know what it was? I, I realized I was running out of this color and I was thinking I might need to save some of this. I have one other skein of this DK that I will need certainly to finish the sweater, but it's a slightly different, it's a different dye lot. And so I was going to try to incorporate this one on the sleeves so that we don't get like a big drastic difference in the color work pattern on the sleeves. The pattern on the sleeves is just this 
flea pattern, so it's it wouldn't be terrible for me to use a different dye lot on the sleeves, but, you know, why not try to make it the best it can be? So for this one, even though it's being knit at a little bit larger gauge, you wouldn't think it would be a problem for me to finish it, but I do have to make some decisions <laughs> here, which is uh, probably the reason this one w went a little bit off the rails in the first place. So I'm going to work on the others first and then see if I can get to this one. As far as this other stuff, so here is my hypnosis sweater, which has gotten basically no work on it since the last time you saw it. So I'm just going to disregard that one because honestly, I want to get all this other stuff done so that I can focus on this. So we'll check back in on that in the future. Here I have a sock that I started that is at this point just the toe. So that's, uh, I'm also not going to be focusing on that this month, although I do want these before the end of the year. So I am knitting these with uh, some old Miss Babs Hot Shot, which I think is a base they don't make anymore. It is absolutely horrific to knit with. There is like no elasticity in this yarn whatsoever. So it's, I find it to be very hard on the hands, but the twist is so tight that it makes incredibly hard wearing socks. So I have a little stash of this and I, I don't knit more than one pair of these a year out of this yarn because my hands can't handle it. So I'm not gonna try to rush on this because I'm not trying to get a repetitive stress injury. And then here we have two blankets and I'm not a knitted blanket person. So I don't know how I have two knitted blankets going uh, all of a sudden, but let's look at this one first. So this is a little fingering weight scrap mitered square blanket. And you can maybe tell that I have a color palette going on here. I have, uh, I'm alternating dark and light squares in sort of like a Battenberg style. And I'm using mostly like pastels for the lights and then darker like greens and browns for the darker squares. This is not going to be done anytime soon. And I think this is one that's going to go in hibernation until I finish the other blanket, just because I find these mitered square blankets like occasionally I get very pumped to work on one but then it just takes so long that I, I fall off track and uh, so I am knitting mine. One of the things that I got to entice myself to work on this, um, I, I've had these for years now but these little short signature needles um, using a size 2.75 millimeter for this and um, I don't have a whole lot of pairs of signatures at all, but they're sort of like a nice little treat for working on this blanket. So that is that. So that one's going away. This one, now I might have a chance of getting this done. So let me pull this one out. So this one is another free pattern from Pearl Soho. This is the Muhurusa blanket. And I have actually really been enjoying knitting this, which I did not totally anticipate because it is all seed stitch and um, I would have thought this would drive me nuts but I actually really like seeing the the different color changes so this is knit on a 4.5 millimeter needle which is a US 7 I think and you hold two strands of fingering weight yarn together throughout and the pattern gives you a guide as far as where to start marling so I am using all yarns that I had in my stash, just fingering weight scraps. And I had a bunch of skeins of undyed yarn that is serving as the background for much of this blanket. So it's mostly greens and blues. This is going to be sort of a couch blanket for my husband probably. And um, this one I think is getting close to 75% done. I think around this stripe was 50%. So I'm there might be a chance I could finish this. I I really hope so. <laughs> the other things are going to get priority, but this is sort of like my simple knitting, my meeting knitting, that type of thing. So there's a chance this one might get done this month. So that sort of feels like a lot. <laughs> I am going to start by knocking some of the easy ones out of the way. So I'm going to block that Jared Flood sweater and I am going to sew the buttons on the Claude cardigan. And then I think I will probably try to finish the wild grass wrap. I think that'll be the first one up. So let's go. So before I block sweaters, I always try them on just to see 
if there's anywhere where I need to like particularly focus when I am blocking. And so I tried this on and I like the way it fits as is. So what I'm gonna do is actually measure across the bust and just try to hit that measurement or get close to it when I am actually laying this out because it's gonna be so heavy, this brioche fabric, once it's wet. I just wanna make sure that I'm not overstretching it. The other thing I'm going to focus on is just trying to get this to lay flat a little bit. I probably could have picked up fewer stitches around this neckline, but I think that this will be able to lay flat once it is blocked. It's on the edge though. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully this will block out nicely. For blocking this, I decided to use warm water with a little bit of soak wool wash and just pushing this under the water right now. I let this soak for maybe around 45 minutes and then I squeezed all of the water out with a towel. One tip for getting some inexpensive blocking mats is to go to an auto parts store. I got all of my blocking mats from Harbor Freight and they were super cheap, way more inexpensive than what is typically marketed to knitters. You'll see that I'm being very careful here as I'm taking this wet sweater out from the towel. I'm really trying not to stretch it unnecessarily in any way. And most of the blocking process for a fabric like this is going to be padding into shape. You can see here, I'm just sort of padding, padding. And every once in a while, I might get the measuring tape out and make sure I'm still on track and uh, make sure my hems are straight and that sort of thing. This looks good enough. I'm pretty satisfied with this. So now I'm going to move on to sewing the buttons on my Claude cardigan. Sewing the buttons on properly is one of the things that can really make or break the finishing of a sweater. I really try to take the time to line up the fronts of a cardigan when I'm doing this to really make sure that as I'm placing those buttons on the button side of the cardigan that the alignment is exactly right between the two fronts because it can be really obvious once you have it on your body. For actually sewing the buttons on, I generally like to use a thicker machine sewing thread. So here I'm using a jeans top stitching thread and I'll pull two strands of that off and then double them in the needle. So I'm actually using four strands to sew that button on. I do this for a couple of reasons. I uh, would prefer to have a thicker, a thicker thread so that I don't have to go through the button as many times. And I find that this just makes it uh, a quicker process for me. In order to get that button placement right, once I have my fronts lined up, I will usually take another pin, like a, I, I'm using a sewing needle here, but I'll usually use like a glass head pin or something like that, and actually put it through the button hole so that I have pierced exactly the place where I need my sewing thread to go in. And then I go in from the front of the garment. Uh, in a case where I am using a backing button, like right here, I'll put the backing button on, which you can see me doing now, and then I'll go back up through to the front of the cardigan. At this point, then I pass the needle through the end of the thread so that all of the cut ends of that thread are gonna be neatly contained under the, uh, the fashion button once it gets sewn on. And I'll usually take my time here to check this placement here right before I put the actual button on the garment. So here we are, all done, and now I think it's time to move on to a little bit of shawl frogging. All right, all done with that. I'm not going to bother rewinding this or reskeining this yarn or anything like that. I am just going to try to keep everything together here so that I remember my intent is to use the Isayer and the Alpaca Lace Weight together in the future. Before the weather gets too terribly hot here, I decided to try to put in some significant work on my Muhurusa blanket to see if I can get this finished before the month of July. There's just something about this seed stitch fabric and the marling that is so satisfying. I really 
Can't believe I'm saying this, but I could see myself making another one of these blankets in a different colorway. Once I got toward the end of my very last skein, I did a little bit of weighing the yarn to see exactly how far I could get. I think the blanket was originally supposed to be a little bit longer than this, but I didn't want to break it to a new skein of yarn, and this ended up working out. So we're getting closer to the end of the month, and I have finished the wild grass wrap on the right, the Muvarusa blanket in the center, and I am starting to make some headway on the sleeves for my blue shimmer. I'm using this really cute Battenberg cake slice stitch marker to show where I was at the beginning of the month, and you can see how much progress I've made. And here's a little sneak peek of what the finished blanket looks like. I am using another stitch marker from the same set. This one is a little lemon cake slice. I will link the maker of these stitch markers down below. I got these as an advent set, like a 12-piece advent set a couple years back. And here again, you can see my progress with the little, I'm not sure what this one is, maybe a cake or a, a cookie of some sort. Uh, you can see I'm just getting started on this sleeve over here and uh, we'll talk about this more in a moment. So I want to show you what the sleeves are looking like on the blue shimmer because I'm at the point where I need to decide how I wanna redo the left sleeve and then I'll rip the right sleeve out and make it to match. So here you can see how this is fitting me. This is cropped. I am wearing it with relatively high-waisted joggers at the moment. And so here's the first sleeve, which actually looks a lot better than I felt like it did the first time, but the cuff is still just too tight for my preference. So what I had done originally was I did decreases as recommended in the pattern until here. And then I knit almost straight. I just spaced two decreases out a little bit further so that the decrease rate would be less severe for this portion of the arm. And then I decreased a lot too much for the cuff. And so this is the around the stitch count for the cuff that's recommended in the pattern. And yeah, I just, I really don't like this. So I, on this sleeve, am at this point here, which maybe you can see. What I like to do is use a different color stitch marker if I change my rate of decrease. So like I was using silver for the regularly spaced decreases, and then I changed to gold for these ones that were a little bit further out. So I'm at this point on the other sleeve. And I think what I'm gonna do is just actually continue that rate of decreasing uh, per the pattern. I should have listened to the pattern there at least until I get close to where I want to start the ribbing, and then I'm not going to do this sort of extreme decrease that happened right above the, the rib. I'm just going to go, maybe I'll do like one more decrease and then just go right into the rib so it's more of like a normal straight sleeve instead of one that has a little bit of gathering. So let's see. Okay, so I have finished my second sleeve and now I'm going to go back and correct the first sleeve so that it will match this one. The sleeve shapes are actually very similar because this was really the only section where I sort of deviated. So this one had much more gathering at the cuff, which you can kind of tell, and then you can definitely tell that this cuff is wider and is more comfortable than my original cuff. So what I'm gonna do is rip this out back to about here and then just do the shaping to match this side. So I did a sewn bind off here because at the time I could tell this cuff was gonna be sort of tight and I wanted a nice stretchy bind off. I'm not gonna unpick this. I'm actually just gonna cut it off <laughs> and, uh, and go from there. Yeah, so you can see, if you do that, you get a little bit of a mess at first, but then if you just keep sort of pulling, you'll find an end. And 
yeah, you can just go from there. So that was definitely worth the probably 20 minutes it would have taken me to pick out that sewn bind off. So I think I should still probably have enough yarn here with this cut end uh, to finish the sleeve because the new revised sleeve is actually slightly shorter in terms of the number of rows. So hopefully I'll make it yarn wise, but if not, I've got plenty of this main color left and I'll just spit splice it in and keep going. So here you can see again how I use the different colored stitch markers to sort of indicate to myself when I started doing something differently. So these two silver ones match up with each other in terms of number of rows on both sleeve. And then here was where uh, the gold stitch markers indicate that I changed the number of rows between stitches. So over here, I did end up just keeping it consistent from further up on the sleeve, but I know that I will need to rip out to about halfway between these two markers and then just re-knit from there. Okay, so we're getting close. I need six rounds above this marker before I have to do my next decrease in order for it to match this sleeve. I know that some people get weirded out by just ripping like this, so I will usually do one of two things at this point. If I am worried about picking up these stitches, what I'll do is actually pick this up, grab a much smaller needle, like a two sizes down, and tink back from here and put each stitch individually on the needle. The other thing you can do is just, you know, take your needle that you are using for this section and um, just pick these stitches up and sort of, once the stitches are on the needle, go around and make sure they're all situated correctly and you're not splitting yarn or anything like that. So uh, that's probably what I'm gonna do here. I need to rip out a little bit further and then we can go on. Okay, so I have all the stitches back on the needle and, well, <laughs> almost all of them. Let's see, there we go. And so you can maybe tell, maybe not because they're actually <laughs> so small, but a lot of them are not seated correctly on the needle. So I don't care about that. I, on this first go around, I just get them all back on the needle and you know, some of them have dropped down a row or so, so I'll need to go back and pick those up on my first trip around, but um, that is how I do that. So what I can do from here is either just do one trip around where I'm not actually knitting the stitches, I'll just make sure they're all seated correctly and, and picked up, or if I just wanna go for it, I can start knitting. And if I have a stitch that is seated on the needle with the back leg forward, I'll just knit it through the back loop, and um, that's another easy way to fix this. So, time to finish this sleeve. So it's a couple of days later, and now that the blue shimmer is done, I've gotten what feels like a bunch of stuff done, I am working on my socks that I had started. I had just the toe when I showed you this project at the beginning of the month, so let me show you where I'm at now. As you can see, I have a half-finished sock here. I decided to go with the heart nut pattern. I will list the pattern and the designer's name below. And this is the type of pattern that I personally like for socks. Something that is simple, has a short repeat where I don't have to look at a pattern and where I can just read my knitting and I don't have to keep track of rows or anything like that. That's sort of my go-to. And I also really prefer toe up socks. So I will generally change any pattern of this sort into a toe up pattern just for my preference. And then I always do a heel flap and gusset. Socks for me are pretty utilitarian of an item. I uh, This is sort of the one area where I don't really care to do a whole lot of new techniques. I know what fits my foot and I will usually just sort of riff on that. I just bound this one off and I just wanted to show you because I know that some people get like real whacked out about what the top of their sock looks like. They don't like uh, using, you know, you obviously need a stretchy bind off here if you are knitting a toe up sock in order to be able to get the thing on your foot. And so I hear people often saying things like, oh, I hate these bind offs that flare out. And it's like, you know, it really doesn't matter if, as long as it's not flaring out when it's on your leg, it doesn't really matter all that much what it looks like when it's not on your leg, right? But 
For this one, I used the bind off recommended in the pattern, which the pattern referred to as an invisible ribbed bind off. And so I wasn't familiar with that. So I was like, huh, invisible ribbed bind off. I'm going to Google and see what that actually is. And it's the same thing that I know as a sewn bind off or an Italian bind off or a tubular bind off with no setup rows right? There are a million different names for this, and it has created a really nice stretchy bind off. I have never used this technique before on a sock, but I think I probably will in the future. The other thing that I always do on a sock bind off is where, as on like a sleeve, if I'm knitting a sleeve from the top down, I would sort of close this gap that's formed because you're knitting in rounds, you're actually knitting in a spiral, right? So you end up with this little bit of a gap between the start of your last bind off round and, and the end of it. And in a sleeve situation or a hem, I would close this off and tighten it up a little bit. But for a sock, I want maximum stretch in order to get this on my leg. And so I just don't connect the last stitch to the first stitch in the bind off round. I just turn it to the inside. I weave my tail in and I don't worry about this little jog because again, nobody's going to see that including probably you when it's actually on your leg. Okay, I have got my toe started for my second sock. And so I figured I would give you a little bit of a close up of my asymmetrical toe that I typically use. So for this toe, you can maybe see that after the very tip of the toe, I have increases only on one side. And I do this because I like to make a defined left and right sock. I find it more comfortable than the sort of like regular wedge shaped toe that you normally get in a sock pattern. For the cuff down version of this, I will link a free vanilla sock pattern in the description below where I actually wrote out the directions for doing this toe from the cuff down. For the toe up, I basically just reversed those instructions. So if you are already comfortable with sock knitting, feel free to just use that pattern and reverse the instructions. Um, otherwise, I will just verbally give you the directions again here now. So to start this from the toe up, what I do is using a US zero, which is a 2.0 millimeter needle. I cast on 10 stitches on each needle using Judy's Magic Cast On, Turkish Cast On, one of those. And I increase on every round four times. So at the beginning and end of each needle, I do an increase until I get to 24 stitches. At that point, I switch to a US1, which is a 2.25 millimeter needle or whatever needle I'm using for the actual main body of the sock. At that point, I will do an increase every other round until I get up to the number that I need for my actual sock. So in this case, it's 31 stitches per needle. I'll usually place a marker on the side that I'm doing the increases on. Just at first, it's not quite as easy to see. So I always do that to make my life a little bit easier. So over here, you can see what it ends up looking like. Now, here's another situation where I'm not gonna get worked up about what this looks like when it's not on my foot, right? Because this cable pattern here is essentially rib on top of the foot. And so it's going to pull in and it's going to make the toe a little bit ripply. But once this is on my foot, it's very smooth and, and there's no uh, excess fabric here. So you can maybe see that these at this point situated like this are the same. The only real thing you need to watch out for if you're doing an asymmetric toe is that you don't want to make uh, two socks that are the, for the same foot. Um, so basically what I'm gonna do on my next round is just knit across and then start my pattern so that I make sure that I'm making a left and a right sock. One other thing to note, so I did uh, place this marker here just to indicate that this round is where I started my, my gusset increases. So I will very often use these type of bulb stitch markers to just indicate to myself that something is going on that I need to replicate on the other, the second item, whether it's a sock or a sleeve. So onward. Okay, it's a couple of days later and I am having to lay off the socks because that yarn is irritating my rotator cuff actually. So that's uh, wonderful. So instead, I guess I'm finally going to figure out what it is that I'm planning to do to finish this sweater. So originally this thing was written to have like a, a long fold over turtleneck and I decided I did not want that. So I think what I'm going to do is put these stitches back on the needle and I was going to add some short rows, which are not in the original pattern, just because at this point the front and back are exactly the same. I would like the back neck to be a little bit higher. And then I think I'm going to do a ribbed fold over neckband 
And for that, I'm just going to hold the main color uh, with two strands together. So this is the, uh, the new T-Den. So I'm gonna do that first. Then I think I will do the sleeves. And then I'll probably come back here to finish the bottom after that point. So let's see how much I can get done this weekend. Hello and welcome back. It is now about a month after I last checked in with you and I had a little bit of a busy month at work so it was just easier for me to keep going and trying to finish things. So right now I'm going to show you what I was able to get done in the last two months. I wasn't able to finish everything, which is fine. Some of the stuff is going into hibernation and some of it is just going to take a long time, so that's just how it is. It's going to seem like I'm showing you a ton of stuff right now, but keep in mind this is really what I've been making since the beginning of the year. So it sort of represents, you know, seven full months of making. I've just happened to finish a whole lot of things in these last two months. So try to keep that in mind. Don't feel bad if you are not a fast knitter. I'm actually not super fast either. I just do it a lot. So here we go. First up is the finished Nido pullover. You can maybe get a sense here, even though this is DK weight, because I use such a nice light yarn, it actually is not super, super heavy on the body. It's got drape almost in the way that like a linen garment has drape. And here you can see I'm showing that I'm wearing it with quite a lot of ease. You can see that I was just able to get the neckline to lie flat. I do think this would have been a little nicer if I'd picked up fewer stitches around the neckline. And you'll see in a second here, the back does drape down quite low. I think partially this is because of the design of the garment and also partially it would have been a little nicer if I had fewer stitches there. So otherwise, I think this is a success. It's a nice sort of sweatshirt substitute and I can see wearing this a lot. Next up is the Claude cardigan. I will show this both open and closed. You can see again I made this with quite a bit of ease because I wanted a nice big house cardigan that would still look relatively professional on Zoom for any work meetings I have to be in. This is just a really simple raglan shape with straight body and actually straight sleeves. The sleeves are knitted straight to the wrist and then there are some rapid decreases at the cuff. The pattern gives you the option to knit the sleeves either flat or in the round, so it is up to you. I chose to knit mine in the round because I don't mind purling, but if you really hate purling, you can knit them flat and then seam them. All in all, I think this is pretty cute, and I'm looking forward to wearing it once it is not as hot out. Next up is my finished blue shimmer. I am so happy with how this turned out, especially considering that this is made up entirely of deep, deep stash for that main color, which is a Cascade 220 fingering, and an assortment of other stash yarns. I think I was able to get pretty close to the intent of the original, and uh, I'm also very happy with the fit. I really love how dramatic these bohus yokes are, especially when you see them from a little bit further away like this. And I really can't wait to make another one. I have to go back to my Poems of Color book and see which one I want to make next. Here you can see the fit that I have in the lower sleeve is a little bit better than that original sleeve I had done. I'm happy with the amount of ease that I have here and especially in the cuff, this is very comfortable now. Here is my finished wild grass wrap. This yarn is majority alpaca content. I think it's 80% alpaca, 20% merino, something like that. And so it has incredible drape and sheen. And I love how the textured pattern of this wrap looks in this yarn in particular. I made this exactly to the length recommended in the pattern and I am 5'2", which I think is like 158 centimeters or so, if that gives you a sense of how much longer you might need to make it if you are taller than me.
Here you can see this gorgeous stitch pattern up close. It is very easy to make and it's really just done with like a one by one sort of twist type little cable. I did it entirely without a cable needle. You definitely do not need a cable needle for this. And it's also very easy to read your knitting. So that was another nice thing. I didn't have to carry the pattern around with me or anything. It was very memorizable very early on. Here you can see another casual way to wear this. And one thing that I can also see doing is doubling it up like this and putting it under like a nice wool coat or you know, if I have a coat that has sort of an opening at the front that I need to protect myself from the wind, this is going to be a nice barrier for that type of styling as well. So here we go, the beast finished Muhurusa blanket. I absolutely love this thing. I'm obsessed with it. Um, here you'll get to see that I have never attempted to model a blanket before that I can remember, um, but here is the whole thing. You can see that I sort of chose to do a little bit of an irregular color pattern and I did follow the changes that are laid out in the pattern. I just had to change colors a little bit more often due to the fact that I was using a lot of scraps, but I think that this is really cute. It's going to be perfect for the winter and I'm very happy. And last but not least for my finished objects, my heart knot socks. I really enjoyed the simplicity of this little cable pattern. It was again very memorizable and very easy to read my knitting, so I really appreciate that. And I will definitely be using these again in the future because this cable pattern, which is essentially like a rib, really makes the socks fit well on my feet. Due to the fact that I've had very little brain power to work with in the last couple of weeks, I actually did put a lot of work in on this little mitered square blanket. I think I calculated the other day that I'm around 20% of the way done, so I still have a significant way to go on this, but that's fine. I'm really happy with the color palette, and I'm finding it really satisfying to sort of lay out my next row of colors and see which ones I want to do, and I'm taking it in a very organic fashion and having a lot of fun with it. And finally, this sweater here really did not get a whole lot of love. I just did not want this thing in my lap once the weather got hot, and uh, I also just wasn't motivated to work on it. Something about this is just uh, crushing my spirit a little bit, so I did get the neckline done, and I'm happy with this. I ended up doing the folded neckline, I folded it over and sewed it down, and I also did a little bit of short rowing at the back, which you can see here, just a couple. I think I maybe did four short rows to raise that up a bit. When it came to sewing those live stitches down on the inside, I actually used some of the same fingering weight yarn from my heart nut socks. There was zero way I was going to be able to do that with the Nuti Den without it breaking, so that ended up working out. You cannot see the sock yarn from the front of the garment, so I think that was a success. And here you can see how far I got on the first sleeve. Really not very far, but hopefully I can get motivated to work on this more once the weather gets colder. I hope you enjoyed that. One thing that I didn't cover in this vlog is that I was actually able to get done a lot of work on my hypnosis sweater, and I didn't want to cover that in this vlog because I'm going to be showing you that in my next episode, which will be the second installment in my Japanese knitting series. So if you have not subscribed yet, please do so you can be notified of when my next episode comes out, and I will see you then. Thanks so much for watching. Bye-bye.